Okay, well, I want to thank you for that gift of chocolate. I really appreciate it. And um, because you all just gave me a gift, I it's appropriate I should try to give something back. So I have a habit of trying to give away books uh, to people in my church. I did bring a copy of Pray for the World. That's the book that I talked about earlier today. So whoever put, I'm going to count to three, okay? And then whoever puts their hand up first, and I don't, I'm not going to say that it's going to be completely fair. It's going to be the hand that I see go up first because sometimes I've done this and I haven't gotten it right. But on the count of three, whoever wants it, put your hand up. And if I see your hand, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. So one, two, three. Back here. Yes, it was you. There you go. Again, I don't, I don't claim it's completely fair, but uh, she was the one that caught my eye first. So anyway, you can get it on Amazon for all those who didn't get the copy. So anyway, thank you so much. Again, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, I, I hope that to this morning's talk was helpful. And, and then I think whenever we're talking about missions, though, of course, uh, the Great Commission uh, will is a familiar phrase that we use to talk about missions, and, and this text specifically is a really important one that we we try to understand. So that's what we're going to be looking at over the next 30 minutes. Uh, so the title is Unpacking the Great Commission. Most of us are very familiar with that phrase. Uh, we use it when we talk about evangelism and missions. It's used often among Christians. Um, the phrase, though, the Great Commission... <clears throat> It's not always been so common. I mean, we use it so often now, but if you would have lived in the past centuries, uh, you might not have been used to saying this as you talk about evangelism and missions. According to the Lausanne report that was just published uh, two weeks ago, uh, the phrase has only been popular for the last 150 years. So the words Great Commission, they're not in the Bible. Uh, the phrase actually became popularized by China inland missionary Hudson Taylor, um, who, of course, lived in China. Uh, Taylor mobilized people to take the gospel not just to the coasts of, of China, like places like Hong Kong, Shanghai, other coastal cities, but actually he saw and realized that the gospel needed to move from the coast of China to the inland provinces. And actually, so, so Taylor popularized it, but... Uh, missiologists and historians say that Taylor actually borrowed the phrase from a Dutch missionary in the 1600s who used Great Commission as a title for a writing he had about Matthew 28. So for the first 1600 years of the church, the phrase Great Commission was, was not associated with evangelism and missions. Uh, Matthew 28 wouldn't have naturally come to mind when you talk about trying to share the gospel. Uh, Matthew 28 was used for an entirely different purpose. It was used to defend the Trinity, that there is one God who exists in three persons. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So if you would have read Matthew 28, 16 through 20 a couple hundred years ago, I don't think you would have imagined instinctively thought like we do today that the gospel needs to go to other countries, even though in the verses we just read, Jesus clearly commands it. So yes, the text does teach the doctrine of the Trinity, it, but it also has a lot to say about how we take the gospel to the world. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to look at the Great Commission. It's one of the most famous passages in the Bible because it's some of Jesus' last words to his disciples. Uh, and the last words said between people are usually very important. If you're going to see your family or friends one last time, what would you say to them? I think it's going to be things that are really, really important to remember. And so Jesus is now sharing with his disciples the information that, that really should guide their future as they think about the rest of their lives. Our outline, you can see it on the screen, four points, the people of the Great Commission, the basis of the Great Commission, the task of the Great Commission, and the promise of the Great Commission. Let's go ahead and look at those first two verses, verses 16 through 17, the people of the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So two things about the people of the Great Commission. So first of all, the Great Commission 
it's for all of us. It's for everyone. Some people have said that Jesus only intended this for the apostles, and it's not really binding for the church today. However, if you read the rest of the New Testament, you can see that the work of going and making disciples, uh, it's not just limited to these 11 men that, are, that uh, Jesus spoke to. Yes, Jesus gives the commission to the disciples, but it's clear the rest of the church took Jesus' words to heart. So if you look at the book of Acts, you'll immediately see all kinds of different, different people participating in going and making disciples. So I just want to mention a couple of the more famous ones from the book of Acts. So you have Paul, Philip, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, Priscilla, and Aquila, and Apollos. All are very involved in going and making disciples. Uh, then when you look at the letters that Paul wrote to the churches, he gave instructions for churches on how to make disciples. He, he told Timothy to go try to find faithful men who could go out and make disciples. So Jesus in, envisions everyone being very involved in the work of disciple-making, and that involves doing it among the nations. Now, that does not mean that everyone participates in the Great Commission in the exact same way. Okay, this doesn't apply to all of us in the same way. Not everyone is supposed to leave their homes. Not everyone is to move to a different country. But everyone is to make disciples. Uh, David Platt, who is an author and pastor, said this, To be a disciple is to make disciples. Scripture knows nothing of disciples who aren't making disciples disciples. So part of being a disciple is intentionally discipling others, and that's for every single one of us in this room. Now notice something else about the people of the Great Commission. They are imperfect people who still need to grow. They have still a lot of areas, they still have a lot of areas of their life where they need to develop. So after the resurrection, the disciples, they make the track from Jerusalem to Galilee, uh, Jesus meets them there, and then when they see Jesus, uh, they respond in different ways. So some of the disciples, they worship him. Some immediately recognize that Jesus is the Lord. Some are filled with happiness. Some worship him. But then the text says that not everyone had that reaction. Some of them actually doubted. Uh, think of Thomas. We know from the Gospel of John, he doubted that Jesus really could have risen from the dead. Now, the people, the disciples, they should not have doubted. They should have remembered that Jesus said that he was going to rise from the dead. But some of them, when they saw Jesus, they didn't respond with worship. They responded with doubt. Christ's followers have a mixed response. Some worship, some doubt. They're all in different stages and that the people that Jesus gave the Great Commission to, they didn't grasp the big picture initially. They didn't understand that Jesus was supposed to rise from the dead. They didn't understand that the gospel is for all peoples. Uh, it was a process for them to get it. Uh, they still needed to grow, but, but the fact that they still needed to grow didn't keep Jesus from giving them a command to go. Right, so Jesus gives the Great Commission to people who still don't fully understand everything. They don't have it all together. And I think that fact should really encourage us as we think about our role in obeying the Great Commission. He gives these final orders to regular Christians who still have a lot of growth to go through. Who were the disciples? Well, when you look at their lives, uh, you see they're actually very ordinary people. Uh, some of them were fishermen. Um, some of them <clears throat> were tax collectors. The uh, Bible says one of them was uh, involved in a, a very uh, radical political party, so he kind of stands out, Simon the Zealot. But we don't really know much about the others. They probably just had ordinary jobs. Uh, there was nothing special about them. And when you look at the early church, you start to see as well that the early church was filled with just common, ordinary people as well. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 
God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. So the disciples and the people in the early church were not a who's who of society. But God chose them so that he would be the one who gets the glory. And I point this out because this really should encourage us as we think about our involvement in what Jesus has commanded us here. Jesus gives the Great Commission to a bunch of ordinary people with regular backgrounds who still need to grow. Who are the people that make disciples of the nations? Well, they're not superstars. They're not superhuman. Instead, it's the people who've experienced God's grace personally in their lives. They've been gripped by God's grace. They know the love of God. And yet they're humble enough to see that they actually still have indwelling sin and they still have to fight against it. There still works in progress. Um, I know a, I have a friend of mine who um, is currently a missionary in Afghanistan. Now, he was there uh, before the Taliban took over, and so when the Taliban took over, he had to flee. Um, but actually, in the last couple of months, amazingly, this guy is now back in there. And um, God saved this man out of a homosexual background. Uh, God saved him and changed him and sent him to one of the spiritually neediest areas of the world. Uh, does he still struggle with same-sex attraction at times? Yes. But he is faithfully following Jesus, and he sought to glorify God among the nations while he's still working on his own spiritual growth. Uh, I remember meeting another Chinese friend when we lived in Beijing. Uh, this man was from uh, a poor background. He was from southern China. He came to Beijing for work, and uh, he struggled with depression. He, he got involved with a, a really solid local uh, church in Beijing, and he was really growing. He sought uh, counsel for helping him with the areas of life that still needed to be addressed, and he just kept persevering, dealing with his own sin. And yet, just a couple of years ago, uh, he's now married, he has a child, his, his family, they left Beijing and are now serving the Lord as missionaries in a very Islamic country in the Middle East. So I think just thinking about who God has used can really encourage us. Brothers and sisters, these are the people who make disciples of the nations. They're just ordinary Christians who are gripped with a passion for God's glory and have personally experienced the love of God in their lives. Don't think that you could never make disciples here or somewhere else because you're still working on some things in your life. Now, to be clear, yes, you have to be theologically equipped. Yes, you need to be growing in your faith. Yes, you need to be fighting against your sin. But God's plan for the nations only happens through incomplete people. It doesn't happen with anyone else. And Jesus tells us why imperfect perfect or imperfect people can go in the next verse. So good point two, the basis for the Great Commission. It's given in verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus has authority over the whole world, over the whole universe. He has authority over the things we can see. He has authority over the things that we can't see. And that should encourage us we think about evangelism and missions. So we cannot change people's hearts. That's not our ability to do that, but God can because Jesus has authority to make that happen. Other religious leaders, they will claim to speak with divine authority. They will claim to speak for God, but none of them have authority like Jesus has. Jesus is the only one who has received divine authority from the Father. And his authority is over every square inch of our world. And Jesus has the right to make this claim because he was raised from the dead. Jesus showed his authority in so many ways. You think about the gospel. Jesus healed people. He cast out demons. He perfectly resisted Satan and temptation. I mean, he was unlike anyone else. He was completely sinless. Um, people opposed him, though, and he was murdered. He was crucified, and he was buried. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead. So Jesus has shown that he has authority over death and all things. And God's plan has always been for Jesus to rule the nations and receive worship. And this wasn't just something that 
Jesus came up with. It wasn't like this is just Jesus' sudden idea to tell the disciples that he has authority. This has been God's plan, really, from the beginning. We see this in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be stopped. So all nations, all languages, all worshiping before him, that's always been God's plan. Jesus has authority so that the nations will worship him. He has authority over every person and every place. Uh, There's no heart that's too hardened that can't be changed by Jesus. There's no government too harsh where Christ doesn't rule. Jesus reigns over all. And because of this, really, there shouldn't be any place that's off limits for missions. If Jesus has authority over every single place in the world, there's no place where missions shouldn't happen. There's really no such thing as a closed country. Now, from our perspective, yes, governments can be very hostile. They cannot want people there talking about Christ. Um, But the idea of a closed country isn't really found in Scripture. Paul faced opposition. He knew he was going to face opposition anywhere he went, and uh, he kept on going anyway. You don't give up on evangelism. You don't give up on missions because governments don't necessarily want you there. The history of missions, it's filled with story after story of hostility first, but then harvest later. We can make disciples of all the nations because Jesus has authority to make it happen. All right, let's go ahead and look at the task of the Great Commission. We see that verses 19 through 20. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So the Great Commission, it's about making disciples. That's the main task. Make disciples is the main verb, the main command in the passage. It's in the imperative. So going, baptizing, teaching, they're they're all dependent on making disciples. They describe how you make disciples. So missions is about making disciples. Missions is not just about making, uh, or <clears throat> making converts and then leaving. Missions is not about just getting people to pray a quick prayer. It's not just about trying to plant churches real fast and then move and leave before the people understand uh, what Jesus wants them to understand. The Great Commission is about making disciples. So that should cause us to ask the question, well, what is a disciple? Well, a disciple is someone who delights in what Jesus says and desires to do what Jesus says. It's someone who reorients his whole life around following Jesus. A a disciple desires to obey Jesus in every single area of their lives. How do we make disciples? But let's look at a couple of key things that Jesus says in the Great Commission. Jesus tells us, gives us three key words. One of those is baptism. All people who want to follow Jesus Christ must be baptized. Now, different denominations will have, of course, different understandings of who should be baptized. But what is clear from our text is that you can't be a disciple without being baptized. Baptism is the initiation right into the church. And it's a matter of obedience for all Christians. Now, to be clear, baptism does not save you. It does not bring about forgiveness of your sins. There's nothing magical that happens by getting wet. All right, That's never going to actually bring about forgiveness. Only Christ's blood can wash away your sins. But normally speaking, Christians must be baptized. And this is one of the clear commandments for all nations. So it doesn't matter what culture you're from you need to get baptized. And so I would just encourage you, if you're here, you've never been baptized, well, please talk with Pastor Hugh. I'm sure he'd love to talk with you more about that. Okay, secondly, another key word we see here about how we make disciples. Making disciples means that we teach. We teach. 
Jesus said that mission involves teaching people everything that Jesus said. So missions involves lots of teaching. Disciple making involves lots of teaching. Disciples are made, not born. People just aren't immediately becoming disciples. Discipleship doesn't happen automatically. People become disciples by knowing and doing all that Jesus says. That includes the encouraging things that Jesus taught. That includes the hard things that Jesus taught. Missionaries need to teach the whole counsel of God when they're doing missions. And I think today, this means that we have to be actually be very careful and thoughtful when we start talking about missions. There are many missionaries today who are sacrificing much for the Lord, but I think sometimes they're just forgetting to keep the main objective, ma- making disciples. Some of them are not making disciples. Sometimes m- missions just neglects disciple making. Uh, today, if you just mention the word missions, that's going to mean a lot of different things to different people. And there's a lot of confusion about what kinds of things churches and missionaries should be doing. So there's a famous Anglican missiologist, maybe some of you have heard of him, called Stephen Neal. He wrote this. It's a very famous saying in the missions world. If everything is mission, nothing is mission. If everything is mission, nothing is mission. So today, again, missions is used very broadly. It can mean a lot of different things to different people, many of which are good things, but don't seem to be focused on what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 28. So if you just mention the word missions, some people will think, well, missions refers to digging wells, uh, building hospitals, helping the poor, providing education for children, teaching people how to farm, starting schools, doing medical work, or working for a more just society. Right? And we would agree, well, those are actually good things to do. Um, again, missionaries in the past have done these things in addition to making disciples. And Christians, we care about all suffering. We should desire to alleviate pain and suffering when we can, for sure. Uh, when I lived in Northwest China, a uh, China Inland Missionary, actually, China Inland Mission, uh, in the early 1900s, they built one of the first hospitals in all of Northwest China, and it was a huge blessing to the peoples in that area. Uh, the Hui Muslims, Tibetan Buddhists, um, the Chinese, they all benefited from it in, in so many ways, and it really enhanced uh, the missionary work that they were doing. It, it really enhanced the gospel to all of these different groups. However, we have to be careful to say that biblical missions is not only doing humanitarian work. It's not only doing humanitarian work. Missionaries bring something that no NGO or no other group can bring, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Missions is planting churches among unreached peoples and making disciples by baptizing and teaching them all that Jesus commanded. And if you don't focus on that, what tends to happen is the social work tends to take over and the disciple-making stops. And this phenomenon has actually been very um, observed and documented by a lot of missiologists. Um, Denny Spitters and Matthew Ellison, you can see this quote on the screen. When Everything is Missions, that's the name of their book. Modern missions history shows us this. Whenever the primacy of disciple-making and church planning have been replaced with efforts to eradicate the world's evil systems, diseases, and oppressions, the global disciple-making activities of the church have foundered. And on the flip side, we can observe that the regions of the world that have seen the greatest democratic reforms and social welfare in the last 300 years are those where missionaries focus most on personal conversion through the preaching of the gospel and least on social transformation. So when you look at the book of Acts and you just see what was the Apostle Paul doing, they were focused on evangelism, they were focused on conversion, they were focused on planting churches, focused on teaching them the word of God. So to be clear, meeting people's physical needs is good, but it must accompany a focus on disciple-making. Okay, thirdly, how do we make disciples? Well, we make disciples by going. 
We make disciples by going. Go is actually a participle. It corresponds to how we make disciples. We are to make disciples of all nations. So the word nations, what does that word actually mean? Well, most of us, when we read the word nation, we, uh, we, we immediately think of a political nation state like Japan, like China, Philippines. But actually, the Greek word that's translated nation is ethne, from where we get the English word ethnic. And so what Jesus is referring to something like ethnic groups, racial groups, language groups, certainly country is part of it. That plays a large part of how we think about our identity. Uh, but that's not the only thing that goes into our identity. Race, culture, language, those things all go into shape one's identity. And so when you try to share the gospel, you, you'll realize that gospel barriers form, around, form along ethnic lines. Uh, the gospel does not easily cross ethnic groups. And so Jesus is calling us not just to go to countries, but to ethnicities. If we think of the Great Commission only in terms of countries, a lot of ethnic groups are going to get left out. A lot of ethnic groups are going to get left out. So just to flesh it out a bit, missiologists, anthropologists say that there's about 17,000 different ethnic groups today. And of those 17,000, about 10,000 of them would be considered reached for the gospel. As I was saying earlier this morning, just because those 10,000 groups are reached, that does not mean there's not lots of work to do among those people. Um, there's lots of needs for evangelism. There's lots of needs for theological training. There's a need for more healthy churches. Uh, but the good news is that those reached areas have evangelical churches that can sustain themselves and reach out to the people around them. That's the condition of about 10,000 of the 17,000 peoples. That leaves about 7,000 ethnic groups where there is no church. We call these groups unreached people groups. There are not many Christians or healthy churches to carry out evangelism to the people around them. Okay, so that's a lot. What does this mean for us? Well, I think in, this, in light of this call to go... All of us do need to prayerfully consider how the spiritual needs of the world mesh with who God created us to be. Uh, I'm going to bring that map up again from earlier just to zoom in. I want us to just look at this area of the world. And then I want you to consider who has God made you to be? Who are you? What languages do you speak? What education level do you have? What kind of business experience, what kind of business background do you have? What is your ethnicity? What is your citizenship? What is your passport country? You know, some of these areas would welcome people from certain passports, passport countries into their areas. And at the same time, some of the countries on this map would certainly reject you if you're from some countries. I mean, my home country, my passport country, is increasingly not welcome in many of the areas. But that might not necessarily be the same case for you. So all of us need to prayerfully think about who God has made us to be. What has been your life experience? What kind of skills do you have? What languages do you speak? Uh, two weeks ago at our church, we had this um, <clears throat> pastor, a local pastor from a different area, from one of these unreached areas. He, he came to Hong Kong, and uh, we did a missions event at our church, and he was talking about, I asked him, like, how could Hong Kong people potentially do mission uh, in your area? And it was really interesting. He said, you know, if Hong Kong people went to his unreached area, they would be immediately welcomed, and they'd be looked up to. They'd be respected, just because the fact they're from Hong Kong. And he was just saying, you know, they would have open doors to build friendships with people. They'd have open doors uh, to share the gospel with people. Now, to be clear, most of us are not called to do full-time cross-cultural missionary work where you leave your home. I know sometimes when, you can, when we talk about this, there can be a lot of guilt that people have, and that's not my purpose. We should not feel guilty if we stay. God has good work for all of us to do right here in Hong Kong. Most of us, I would say, are called to stay and to support and to send. There are unreached peoples right here in Hong Kong. We can reach out to them. We can give financially to support missions. But having said that, 
it could be that God might be calling some of you to go. It is healthy for a church to send out missionaries. It's a healthy thing. It's a healthy characteristic. And all of us need to prayerfully consider who has God made us to be? What kind of unique doors might God open for someone like you? Okay, we have another great encouragement as we send people out, as churches send people to go. We need to remember God is not sending them out alone. When they go to these areas, they're not going to be alone. Jesus promises them his presence. Look at Matthew 28, 20. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus, he's saying something here that's very, very important for us to remember. He's giving us a precious promise that we must cling to. Jesus will be with us. Jesus came into the world to be with his people. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And so Jesus wants his disciples to really have this as an anchor to their souls. He wants them to cling to this promise. Even if they can't see Jesus, Jesus is with them. Um, the Greek text actually says Jesus will be with them all the days. So the word for always actually is all the days in the Greek text. Surely I will be with you all the days, even to the end of the age. Every day Jesus will be with you. There won't be a day when you're alone. He has all authority over all the nations. He will be with us all the days. There will be trials when you try to take the gospel to the nations. There's going to be ministry situations where you really don't know what to do. You're going to try to share the gospel. There's going to be language barriers. You're not understanding what's really happening. There's going to be all kinds of cultural barriers as well. But even in all of those, Jesus wants us to remember this promise. He will be with us all of the days. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us clearly from the Great Commission. Lord, we thank you to use weak, imperfect people to carry out your work. Lord, we do pray that you'd help all of us to know how we fit in into your plan. And Lord, we do pray that you'd guide us so we can be obedient to your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.